Well, welcome to our second panel session. And I will tell them that it is fresh water in front of you. It's not left over from this morning. And um, um, I'm here to introduce Lara. And you've met her before. And she will, is in our geography department. And going through her CV, she's an expert on invasive plants following some kind of uh, modification of the landscape, and she's also the director of our Center for Latin American Studies here at Rutgers. Where is she? I was. Lara. I was. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> director. We have a new director now for the center. Thank you, Jim. That's very nice uh, introduction. So actually, um, I'm replacing the person that was supposed to be on, I think it's on your agenda. Uh, uh, she's the co-director of the Rutgers uh, Climate Institute, uh, Professor Robin Leinchenko. She's actually under the weather, so, so I'm taking her role today. So welcome to our afternoon uh, panel. Uh, so I'm going to just introduce you to the, to the panelists. We'll have a similar format to this morning. Uh, the panelists will have 15 minutes to talk each, and then we have uh, our um, uh, keynote speaker again, uh, Petra, uh, talking for, for five minutes. Uh, so our panelists this afternoon are uh, uh, Sandra Batista. She actually is a former uh, PhD geography student, and now she's uh, currently a senior research associate at the Center for International Earth Science and Innovation Network at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Uh, Nathan Engel, uh, environmental specialist at the World Bank. Uh, and our own uh, Heidi Hauserman, a, a system professor in human ecology, geographer as well. And I think uh, already Heidi introduced to us uh, uh, Petra. So, so we're going to start um, um, with, with Heidi. And, uh, uh, and again, it will be 15 minutes each, and then we'll have some time for discussion at the end. Yeah, it's a new one. It's a lot easier to use. Okay, hi again. Um, I want to start off by thanking the organizing committee and especially Marjorie, who I know put a lot of work into making this day happen. And thanks everyone who, especially those who traveled to get here today from speakers um, to poster presenters to attendees. So I'm a geographer and an assistant professor here in the Department of Human Ecology. And this panel is focused on adaptation to climate change in tropical regions. But before I turn to adaptation, I want to start by discussing vulnerability. And what I'm going to share um, dovetails really nicely with what Petra just presented. It'll um, ground a lot of what she said in a couple empirical case studies. And we didn't plan that at all, but it worked out great. So, more specifically, I will highlight the ways marginalized people are often not well prepared to respond to climatic changes due to already existing everyday vulnerabilities, which stem from social, political, and economic dynamics. And there are people who have written much more prolifically about this topic than I have, including people in this room, Petra, uh, Robin Lachenko, who unfortunately couldn't be here, Jesse Rabot, Neil Adger, among many others. So vulnerabilities do not only emerge from observable phenomena like rising seas, melting permafrost, and drought. They are also rooted in people's understandings of and experiences with climatic, political, economic, and historical processes. Mitigating vulnerabilities to climate change thus must take into account cultural and political economic conditions shaping people's everyday lives, including development interventions themselves. I also want to highlight that within marginalized groups and communities, vulnerabilities are highly differentiated based on social difference such as income, age, gender, ethnicity, and so on. And a more critical engagement with interacting and socially differentiated vulnerabilities will help us better understand what makes particular bodies in particular places more exposed to different risks and socio-environmental changes and how these issues might be dealt with more comprehensively. 
So I'm going to work through these two points using cases from Ghana, where I've worked since 2010, and Veracruz, Mexico, where I conducted dissertation research between 2003 and 2010 and have since revisited. So the images um, here show uh, the area surrounding the community of Pococrom in 2008 and 2013. Um, so you can see the River of Fien in both images. You can see the same road bisecting the two images. This here, this is the community of Pococrom. And you can see this huge explosion of small-scale, unremediated mining um, sites basically encircling this community. Um, and this is due largely to uh, uh, the explosion of mining on the landscape is, um, was due largely to the, uh, the price of gold, um, which has increased 600% in the last 14 years, as well as foreign in intervention. Most of these sites um, were foreign operated. So um, people came in, brought machineries and capital, quickly cleared existing land uses and started mining gold. These sites are intensive and ephemeral. Um, when operations move on, they uh, often do not reclaim the land. So what is left is an enormous pit uh, that over time fills with water and uh, poses all sorts of hazards. And one interview that um, we did with a, a community member, this individual said, before the Galamse, my mother was farming yam, maize, cocoa, and other ca cash crops on that land, but they destroyed it without any compensation. When she complained, they threatened that they will prosecute. You know in Ghana, justice is not fair when the case is between the rich and the poor, so she abandoned it. Critical geographers and development scholars have shown that um, many of these land grabbing interventions represent new forms of enclosure and privatization through dispossession and constitute the most recent round of dispossession in sub-Saharan Africa. These transformations also um, possess many important implications, including food security, as these land cover and land use transitions happen. So this is a quote from another community member. This individual said, after they left, food is very scarce. There are no fishes or bushmeat because everything has been destroyed. They used to grow vegetables along the Ophine River, but now the whole place has been destroyed. They don't even have a place to grow maize. So Petra and I have been doing some work um, in this area since 2010, um, looking at, at these land use transitions. And there is also an indication that rainfall events in this area are becoming more frequent and more extreme. And so um, these increased intensive rainfall events combined with topographical changes and a total alteration of the hydrology uh, in this area leads to an incredible amount of stagnant water on the landscape. Um, there's a lot of flooding and there's just a lot of low quality still standing water. Uh, in a really terrific paper, Lambin et al. Um, talk about how uh, this is um, the, the emergence of diseases in landscapes that have been um, disturbed or altered in combination with climate change is leading to new pathogenic landscapes around the world. And in Ghana, um, in, and people are coming in contact with these aquatic land uses and these new flooded areas in their everyday lives. And in this particular area where we've been working, um, we've been studying the emergence of Beruli ulcer, which is an incredibly devastating, necrotizing skin infection. The mode of transmission is unknown, so no one knows how people get the bacteria into their bodies, but it is associated with uh, aquatic land uses um, and also highly disturbed environments. There was a recent paper um, this year that also associated Beruli out uh, Beruli ulcer outbreaks with El Nino events in South America. So worldwide, Beruli ulcer disproportionately affects women and children, likely, very likely due to aged and gendered livelihood practices, as well as the complex factors in different locations that make these particular groups immunocompromised. So 
With the case of Burule ulcer emergence in, in Ghana, we can really see multiple processes converging, including the global, the global gold market, foreign investment, and increased rainfall events to impact people's everyday lives and exposure to the disease, to, to possibly the, the pathogen that creates Burule ulcer. Not to mention food security issues and hazards that the pits them po themselves pose. We also see that particular people, those whose land has been taken for mining, women, children, and others, become increasingly vulnerable through these processes. So I'm going to now take us to um, Veracruz, coffee, coffee country of Veracruz. So most of you are probably aware that in the late 1990s and early 2000s, there was a, a huge crisis in the coffee commodity market, um, and this crisis was uh, largely felt in, the, in historic lows in the price of coffee that was paid to um, producers themselves. And this wreaked havoc all over the world for millions and millions of coffee producers um, who had, had benefited from a relatively stable market through the International Coffee Agreement and were suddenly, um, the price, their coffee was worth nothing overnight. And so my dissertation work was working uh, with coffee farmers in Veracruz um, who, like other coffee producers in other parts of the world, were really suffering. So one farmer said to me in 2008, um, and these are people that were, that were already operating with limited land and resources prior to the, to the um, deregulation and destabilization of the market. So one farmer said to me, we suffered a lot during the coffee crisis. I didn't hire labor, I applied fewer chemicals, and still I lost money. In 2002, I sold a piece of my land to my cousin from Hiko. His son works in the United States, so he had some money and gave me a good price. And what I really want to flag here is the second sentence um, where, where this individual says, I didn't hire labor. And this is something I heard again and again uh, from coffee producers in this area. The coffee harvest is incredibly labor intensive and it also can last many, many months. If you've ever seen a coffee branch, the um, berries ripen at different times, so you constantly have to go back to the branch and pick the right berries. Um, and it can last, like I said, several months. And so while I didn't work with coffee laborers themselves, um, this was something that I heard again and again, that the first thing when the, when the market dropped out and the price um, bottomed out is that people let go of, of their laborers. And in this particular area of Veracruz, the seasonal coffee laborers are indigenous Nahuatl people from higher elevations. So the coffee belt is about between 600 and 1,500 meters above sea level, and these people were living up around 3,000 um, meters. And they would come down, um, they had for generations come down, harvested coffee as a family, often lived in the homes of these um, coffee producers, and then gone back up after the harvest. And they had been hit incredibly hard. I visited um, one community with an anthropologist friend a couple of times, and early on in my dissertation research in 2003, right at like the height of the coffee crisis, um, a woman said to me, uh, no one is working in coffee. There is no work. The conditions of our crops are not good. There have been aguaceros like never before, and the milpas are so humid. A fungus is growing on everything. The maize is almost spoiled. So again, we see the convergence of political economic changes, commodity markets, unusual rainfall events, and poor health, this time crop health, food security, and suffering, and the enormous constraints that people face in responding to these interacting factors. I just also want to note that the, um, there were two consecutive and historically unusual rainfall events that hit Veracruz in uh, September 2013, last year, um, that one of the major landslides that was an outcome of the storm happened very close to this particular, um, the Nahuatl community that I, I visited in Veracruz. Meanwhile, down in the peri-urban coffee belt, producers themselves responded very creatively to the coffee crisis, diversifying livelihoods in multiple ways, including through other engagement with other agricultural sectors, off-farm labor, and partial land sales. And in a, a, a 
a paper that I published this year uh, in the Journal of Human Ecology, I show how they did this while maintaining, um, largely maintaining the coffee canopy intact. Uh, coffee in this region is grown under a shade canopy. And this has really, this livelihood, sort of this autonomous um, livelihood diversification, which these particular producers were very well situated um, to do due to proximity to urban areas as well as some other agricultural um, sectors. It has really bolstered their resilience, not only to economic shocks um, or political economic changes in one particular sector, but also to climatic change. And one uh, farmer captured this really well in 2008. He said, 20 years ago, it was all coffee. If it rained heavily, the flowers were knocked off the coffee plants and you lost the whole harvest. But these days, if we get a downpour, we can count on cane and limes, which like the rain. So to conclude, vulnerabilities are often multiple and interacting. Particular individuals, in the cases I've highlighted here, um, women, children, the poorest of the poor, and ethnic minorities constitute the most vulnerable. And I think we must have a much more comprehensive understanding of site-specific vulnerabilities vis-a-vis -vis socio-ecological change. Uh, and marginalized groups are often not well prepared to respond to climatic change due to these already existing everyday vulnerabilities. Um, and I believe that mitigating everyday vulnerabilities should be a key component of enhancing adaptation to climate change. And then finally, I believe that policies and development interventions aimed at enhancing adaptations need to be context specific, they need to build upon local knowledge, and they should support the practices and strategies that marginalized people themselves deem viable. Um, and I think some of the most interesting work in this area um, is coming and really, really incredibly practical suggestions about how this can be done is actually coming from agroecologists, um, people such as Miguel Altieri, Stephen Gleisman, Yvette Perfecto, and others. So with that, thanks very much. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, again, uh, just keep your questions but for the end so you can write them down now. Uh, our second panelist uh, today is uh, Sandra Batista from uh, Columbia University. So first, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Laura and Marjorie for the invitation. It's really nice to be back. As Laura mentioned, uh, I was a student here. I was a graduate student here, both for my master's and my PhD. And Laura was one of my committee members, um, as was Robin Lychenko. Um, and I also taught here both in the geography department and the human ecology department. So I'm a, I'm a geographer. And uh, after I finished my PhD, I went on to do a postdoc at the Earth Institute at Columbia. And I was hosted by the Center for International Earth Science Information Network, CSIN. And then after I completed a two-year postdoc, I continued there. Um, and now I'm uh, there as a research, um, uh, senior research associate. Um, and I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with uh, the, the issues that Petra, the challenges that Petra raised in her talk, and also um, some of the issues that, that Heidi's raised. I think that. Uh, the, the, um, the work that I'm involved in now in East Africa uh, with CSIN um, is going to connect well with some of the issues have been, have, that have been raised, as well as the questions that were asked after Petra's keynote. Um, so I've titled uh, this talk, Regional Coordination and Capacity Building for Spatial Vulnerability Assessments and Climate Vulnerability Mapping. And here I just want to point out and highlight that the capacity building, when I think of capacity building, uh, this is not just capacity building in East Africa with the, the, our partners in East Africa, but it's also capacity building for season. Um, and, and it's really, you know, the interactions um, are really advancing the way that, that our methodologies and the way that we conceptualize uh, vulnerability and our, our approaches to vulnerability mapping. 
Okay. Uh, so just a little bit of background because some people may not be that familiar with uh, the Earth Institute uh, or CSEN. Uh, CSEN is one of 28 research uh, units or programs uh, within the Earth Institute. And most of those units are located um, in uh, Manhattan, but there are a few of us, three of us, that are located um, in Palisades, New York, on the Lamont campus. Uh, so there's CSEN, the IRI, which is short for International Research Institute for Climate and Society, and then there's another one, uh, the Agriculture and Food Security Center. Uh, so this is um, the Lamont campus. Season is housed in the, the building, the geoscience building right there in the upper right. And um, I also wanted to mention that if, you're, if you'd like to visit, one opportunity is an open house that's held uh, usually in early October. Um, and then you'd have a chance not only to, uh, to visit Season, but all of the different units on the Lamont campus. Uh, so Season, to give a little bit of uh, history about Season, Season actually has existed for 25 years. Uh, we're celebrating our anniversary this year, but it started out as something called the Consortium for International Earth Science Information Network in Saginaw, Michigan. And then about 15 years ago, a little over 15 years ago, it moved to join the Earth Institute at Columbia. So we have about 45 people on staff, and uh, the structure of the organization we've got, so I'm part of the Science Applications Division. Uh, we've also got a Geospatial Division, uh, a, a large group in the IT division, the programmers and web developers, and then of course we've got uh, folks supporting uh, outreach and administrative functions and archiving um, and a variety of other things. Okay, to give you a sense of the range of projects uh, that Season is involved in, I've just listed uh, a selection here. Uh, but today I'm gonna talk about the two USAID uh, projects listed there in the middle. So the ARCC program, African and Latin American Resilience to Climate Change, that one is a three-year program that just concluded, just concluded last month in October. And I was involved with that one. Um, and the, the one that I'm gonna focus on today is PREPARED, Planning for Resilience in East Africa through Policy, Adaptation, Research, and Economic Development. And PREPARED is a five-year program. Uh, we're just uh, starting our third year, um, and I'll provide some, uh, some of the specifics to that. Okay, but before I do that, I just have a couple more slides about um, some things that may be of interest uh, at Season. So Season is also a host of the NASA Socioeconomic Data and Application Center, CDAC. Um, so C the, the, the CDAC mission is to support the integration of socioeconomic and earth science data. So if um, one of the one of the uh, products that you may be familiar with, and this is one at the, at the global scale, uh, is called uh, the Gridded Population of the World. And uh, right now, if you visit the GPW site, website, you'll have access to GPW version three, but we're very close to releasing the next version, GPW four. And we actually, uh, one of my colleagues is, is here today, Lyun, and he actually is one of the people who works. There's a, there's a pretty large team of people uh, working on this uh, product and what it is, because it is relevant to, to the, the work that I'll talk about next on, uh, on construction of vulnerability indices. Um, it's um, basically this team painstakingly goes country by country to uh, gather demographic data, census data, um, at the highest resolution possible, the smallest spatial unit available, and then they go through the work of, of uh, synthesizing, harmonizing, the, the spatial boundaries uh, and, and creating a layer, a, a gridded data set uh, that, that then uh, people can use either for, for studies at the, the global scale or, or any other uh, scale of interest, including uh, transboundary scales. And actually one, uh, one of the advances of GPW4 is that now uh, gender and uh, age structure data will also be included. So that's, that's to come. Um, and so on a very different spatial scale, Season is involved in projects um, here in the Mid-Atlantic region. And since this is the inaugural Mid-Atlantic Region Conference Symposium, I thought I would also mention, uh, provide an example of, of, a, uh, of work at that scale, which is funded by NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Um, and this is in partnership with Stevens Institute. So it's um, similar to a poster that I saw uh, today, the NJ ADAPT uh, work 
Um, this is a, a flood hazard mapping tool um, focused on the Hudson, lower Hudson River. Okay, so um, again, PREPARED stands for Planning for Resilience in East Africa through Policy Adaptation Research and Economic Development. Um, the overall goal of this program is to strengthen the resiliency and sustainability of East African economies, transboundary freshwater ecosystems and communities. Um, as I said, it's a five-year program, and it includes five uh, countries in East Africa, and these are the, the partner states of the East African community. So it's uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi. Um, and actually, the, the main focus of the program is on the Lake Victoria Basin. Um, there's also an effort at, a, at, a, at the spatial scale of the Mara River Basin, which is both in Kenya and, and Tanzania. So it's working on different spatial scales. Uh, here are the institutions that are involved. So the major, uh, one of the major partners is the East African Communi Community Secretariat, which is headquartered in Arusha, Tanzania, but also has national level offices in each of the five countries. Um, the Lake Victoria Basin Commission, and then there are regional institutions, um, the two main ones being the, uh, what's called ICPAC, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development Climate Prediction and Application Center, and this is the regional center for climate, uh, climate forecasts, that produces climate forecasts. And one of the things that they organize in conjunction with the uh, WMO, with the World Meteorological Organization and other institutions is something called uh, the GACOF, the Greater Horn of Africa Climate Outlook Forum. And this is a meeting that happens uh, three times a year to provide the seasonal forecast, the next four months, what to expect in the region. And I've had the opportunity now, I've been working on this project for the last two years, and I've had the opportunity now to go to two of these GACOFs. I went to uh, one in Eldoret, Kenya in uh, August of 2013, and then again a year later in August, this past August, in um, it was actually in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. And it's an opportunity for not only the climate scientists, not only the meteorology community, but other stakeholders, other, uh, other folks to come together and at the same time that uh, the climatologists are presenting these seasonal forecasts, the, um, the other communities meet in breakout groups. So for example, there's a breakout group. The first year I participated in the health breakout group. Another year, uh, this, this, the, the past time I participated in the group for the journalists, for the media. And so what happens in those breakout groups is they interpret the climate forecast for their particular area of expertise for their particular sector of activity. Um, because a big challenge is translating climate forecasts in a way that is understandable and usable by different types of stakeholders, different, uh, different um, interested actors. And this is something that rotates, that moves around and is in, held in different countries and different cities to facilitate, to allow for uh, participation, uh, broader participation. So other partners are FUSENET, the Famine Early Warning System, and there's an office in Nairobi in the region, uh, the World Meteorological Organization, um, and we're coordinating with them to do this work uh, in, in, in uh, keeping in mind the global framework for climate services. Um, and um, the, the prepared project is implemented by a company called uh, Tetratech ARD, so Season is one of an, a number of uh, subcontractors that have been um, brought in to work on to provide support or particular expertise in, in a certain area. Okay, I'm gonna skip that one for, because of the time, but it's just, you can look up a little bit more information about the Global Framework for Climate Services. Okay, um, the prepared program is actually divided into three major components, um, and these represent these three main objectives. Improve climate change adaptation technical capacity, Policy, policy leadership and action readiness of regional institutions, uh, strengthen resilient and sustainable management of biologically significant transboundary freshwater ecosystems in the East African communi community region, and enhance resilient and sustainable water supply, sanitation, and wastewater treatment services in the Lake Victoria Basin. Season's role is primarily to contribute to that first objective, uh, which is the climate change adaptation component. Okay, and um, here's a little bit more of the specifics 
of the climate change adaptation component. So the goals um, of that component are just to support the establishment of an EAC climate change co coordination unit. So that has been established and is um, now being developed and, and will grow over time uh, to improve access to and sharing of climate information. And one of the things that we're doing in addition to the support for adapt, uh, adapt, um, capacity building and vulnerability mapping is also uh, we've been working to carry out a survey in all five countries, semi-structured uh, interviews with providers and users of climate information in the region to better understand uh, both the supply and demands for climate information and how to improve um, that, th th that kind of communication in the region. Um, and uh, th the next objective of that, of the climate change adaptation component, is uh, to mainstream climate change adaptation strategies, uh, conduct vulnerability impacts and adaptation assessment in the Lake Victoria Basin region under the EAC Climate Change Technical Working Group. And so the vulnerability mapping that I'll present uh, is, um, is part of that objective. Okay, so uh, there's an organization in the region, RCMRD, that um, provides um, expertise in, 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 ge in geospatial technologies. Um, and it was the logical partner, uh, the host, to uh, hold, to organize and hold uh, workshops, training workshops with GIS experts in the region on spatial vulnerability assessments and constructing uh, climate vulnerability indices and carrying out climate uh, vulnerability mapping in the region. So with the, with the um, uh, collaboration of the EAC Secretariat and other partners, GIS specialists in each of the countries were identified and they were invited to participate in, two, in a, well initially a training back in May, it was a five day training, and it started off with data um, for Kenya, because at that point that's the data we were able to gather, and we, um, two of our GIS specialists, uh, Melanding Jaite and Trisha Chayon, uh, were the instructors, there were also climate scientists from ICPOC, uh, there were other participants in addition to the, to the GIS analysts who were the trainees. And together, they went over the process of constructing, um, constructing the climate vulnerability indices and learning how to use ArcGIS and R statistics software to map the results of these indices. So I know I'm running out of time and we can continue in the, uh, in the discussion, but what I wanted to say is that even though the conventional uh, formula that Petra mentioned of, uh, you know, exposure, sensitivity, adaptive capacity indicators being uh, aggregated into a vulnerability index. That was what was used in this training, but the idea is that this is the start of the development of a community of practice that over time can refine the methodologies and can, uh, you know, really uh, innovate frameworks for defining vulnerability. Um, and I'll just... Uh, uh, one quick thing. So we have, uh, I forgot about these two slides, we have resources that you may be interested in from the ARCC program, and these are um, basically documents that review uh, the literature on the design and use of composite indices for climate change vulnerability and assessments of climate change vulnerability and resilience, and, um, and another one that Alex, Desher so that one I, I was one that I worked on, Alex Sherman and I, worked on the one on spatial climate change vulnerability assessments. Uh, there's one that's an effort to uh, conduct mapping in Mali, and then a downscaling, one on downscaling climate change projections. And there are also many other publications available through ARCC. So those are resources that you can, you can use and that the people that we're working with in East Africa um, can use as well. Thanks. Thank you, Sandra. So uh, just uh, uh, our next uh, panelist is uh, Nathan uh, Engel from uh, the World Bank. So probably. It's a real complicated job. So your, uh, your cab is coming out of Maybe I'll start now. Um, I want to thank everybody for, uh, for having me and thank Marjorie uh, for inviting me and ask the Madam Timekeeper to just indulge me in one extra minute so I can address uh, two of the 
two, of the, two points that were raised uh, with respect to Petra's talk. Um, the first is on the issue of funding and the international funding for adaptation. Um, I think I'm probably pretty uh, on, well positioned to answer that question, so I figured I'd address it from the beginning. Um, so I think that we're getting there. I don't think we're, we're there quite yet. I think uh, what Sandra was talking about was a really good example from the USAID work of just really how sophisticated, how nuanced these assessments are getting. And I was just in, a, uh, in, in two or three days of workshops with most of the multilateral development banks and bilateral development banks talking about very sophisticated issues on how we, how we measure adaptation, how we measure adaptive capacity, and how, um, how we, we know that the, the financing is actually contributing to building resilience, uh, as well as the broader risk management of, of climate and disaster risks. So there's, there's a lot going on, and I'll talk a little bit about it at the very end of my, of my remarks, but I did want to just address that in the beginning. And then the second one is just to say, um, I, before entering the climate policy world, I did have uh, a background in doing some empirical work on adaptation, uh, particularly in assessing and evaluating adaptive capacity and resilience. And I, I hope that you would be happy, Petra, that I did not do maps. Uh, I actually resisted very, very much so the, the, the temptation, there is a temptation to, to make your indicators into a map or to, to, to actually put ad adaptive capacity onto a map. And not only is it hard, I think it's very, um, it could be misguided in many ways. So, uh, so with that, I just want to say, uh, say those two comments and then uh, proceed to my talk. So I am a uh, climate change specialist at the World Bank and I'm in the unit that's called the climate change policy team. It's a new unit that's under the, the vice presidency of climate change which uh, is involved with this gigantic restructuring that's happening which I won't go into the boring details but only to say that it's been elevated as an issue and prioritized at the senior levels of the institution so there are literally hundreds of people working on climate change and I'm going to talk about two things. There's a lot of adaptation work, but I'm involved very intimately with, with two particular uh, things I want to share with you today as they relate to the tropics. So the first is some work that I'm, a project I'm co-leading in Brazil to, on drought resilience. Uh, the second is uh, the, the higher level, I'd say the 10,000 foot level work that we're doing on climate and disaster risk screening. So this first topic, a lot of people don't know that Brazil has a, um, quite a semi-arid region, a very dry and drought-prone area in the northeast. And it's circled here, or sorry, it's in the, the, the dotted square in red. Just to zoom down a little bit, you'll see the semi-arid region is actually across nine states, and it takes up the majority of those states. So there is, there's a lot of climate stress going on here. It's not just droughts, it's, it's floods as well. And what this looks like on the ground in the northeast, not quite getting to the droughts yet, but it's quite a diverse landscape. You'll see a lot of cities. You'll see cities by the coast, cities by rivers. You'll see rain-fed agriculture. Uh, I should mention here that the region is one of the, is one of the poorest regions in, in the country, uh, but they have seen a lot of development progress over the last couple decades. But there still is a lot of, um, a lot of subsistence farming, rain-fed agriculture, uh, forage and herding. But then you see juxtaposed with large, massive water, re, uh, water infrastructure projects, water resources management projects, cisterns. So this is, this is really what you see when you're in Northeast Brazil. But then you also see the challenges. Every picture that was on the previous page is affected by drought. So the reservoirs are very, very low right now. You see cattle dying. These are pictures actually that a lot of our, um, a lot of our staff had taken uh, in various missions that they're on. The cities are also affected. So, this is a region that is often under crisis for droughts. And right now, the northeast of the country is in one of the worst droughts that they've ever faced in the last uh, 50 to 100 years. And I'm not gonna go into the details of this, of this figure, um, but just to say that the histograms are representing each, each set of, his, each histogram represents a year, and this is the distribution of rainfall for one state in Northeast Brazil, which is Ceará. It's a state we do a lot of work in, but I think it's representative of what's going on there in the country right now, or in that region right now. Uh, Multi-year multi drought, three droughts in a row indicated by the red bars, preceded by a relatively neutral year, and then 
a previous year was really dry. And what that translates into is you know, reservoirs that are at 30% capacity on average across the states or less. Most of the drinking supply reservoirs are below 10%. Some are as low as three, two, or one. Some have dried up. So we have a long history, the World Bank does, in working with the northeast of the country and Brazil in general, but I want to highlight two technical assistance programs and really dive into the details of one of them. The second one that's listed here, this 2013 program that I'm helping to lead on building drought preparedness and proactive drought policy and planning with the Ministry of Integration. And then there's also one slide I want to show on some climate work we did with the National Water Agency, and that's this one. So. I won't get into the details of the, of the modeling that was done, but essentially we worked with our partners to project what the impacts would be from climate change uh, within the region, particularly within river basins in the region. And we combined these with hydrological models, demand models, economic models, to talk about what adaptation options might be. But I didn't want to talk in this particular um, conversation about those, the adaptation um, you know, adaptation implications, but just to show that the projections are that this area is going to become more arid, not because of decreased precipitation per se, because that signal is not clear, but more because of increased evapotranspiration and the altered timing of, uh, of runoff. One thing I do want to say, though, is that when you're thinking of Brazil today, November 21st, you're probably thinking about the droughts in the southeast in Sao Paulo. You probably have heard, or many of you have heard, that Sao Paulo is, is experiencing the worst drought in 100 years. It's getting a lot of attention. Uh, a lot of it is being blamed on this lack of planning or contingency planning, or just even being ready in general, having thought through that a drought could even occur in the region. And our work is actually getting a lot of attention because of this drought, even though we're working in the northeast, but because of this drought, they want to know what they can do better and do more proactively to address this issue. So this is where, where what we've been doing comes into play. And really, the crux of it is that we're working to make sure that uh, there's another side of the equation that is brought into this discussion to reduce vulnerability and increase adaptive capacity and resilience. And it's not just the infrastructure. It's not just you know, having a, you know, some, some response programs that help to bail farmers out of, a, of, the, of the drought, but it's thinking through systematically what you can do to plan for the droughts, how you can get better information to do that planning, uh, how you can understand your vulnerability and assess it, and then what are the mitigation actions you can do not when you're not in a drought, when you're in a drought, and then after, after the drought has, has hit or left. So it's these three pillars that I showed on the previous slide that really are the foundation of what we do, and we're implementing two, pro two parts of the program in parallel. The one is this high level, like at the federal level dialogue, trying to understand with the federal government what a national drought policy would be. So we're helping to convene uh, some conversations on this, uh, some workshops. We work with our partners across the Northeast to really think through um, what does it mean to live in the semi-arid region? So thinking about this broader context of vulnerability, but then what does the role of drought preparedness do to help alleviate the vulnerability, um, the issue of vulnerability? So this conversation is ongoing, and it's happening at the same time as the second part, which is this regional pilot that we have in the Northeast to actually show wh what does it mean to do proactive drought policy and planning? What is drought preparedness? How to make it tangible? So the idea was that we would, sh we would demonstrate some really concrete ideas and tools, starting with a drought monitor for the Northeast, and then also showing and demonstrating across various types of communities what drought preparedness planning looks like. How can you do it? What, what does it mean to do uh, a drought preparedness plan? So these maps are the product of that first point on the drought monitor, and for those of you in this audience, you'll probably be familiar with the U.S. drought monitor looks very similar because it's actually um, based on the U.S. Drought Monitor and the Mexican Drought Monitor and also from work done in Spain. But we convened uh, partners through a process with, uh, with, our, with our counterparts in Brazil to actually get this to happen. And the interesting thing is that I want to say about this is that this is the map, this is the final product, but really the hard work is the institutional work. The hard work is the process that goes 
into producing these maps, and that's where I think the capacity has been built, where adaptive capacity and resilience has been built, in so far as they have a network now of professionals, they have states sharing information, they've opened their data, they actually get the, um, the institutions to work to make the data interoperable, they have memoranda of understanding on this issue, and this wasn't happening in the past. Each state wanted to go about it their own way. It's also a, a very technical, it's a very technical process, but it's also very political. So there's you know, battles between the federal government and I don't want to say battles, but mm -hmm. tensions between federal government wanting to own something like this versus the, the, the state governments or the regional governments wanting to own something like this. So it's a success story, I think, though, because this was started a year ago and it's going to be operational in about a month and a half. And there's, 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 I think, a lot, of, a lot of good that can come out of this, and it's because it will link to um, operational drought preparedness plans, and that's what I'm gonna talk about uh, just really briefly on this last point for this particular topic. So the drought preparedness plans, they're based on those three pillars of drought preparedness, and the idea is that they will be operational in the communities, and the maps that I showed you on the monitor, what, what they do is they're based on more objective understanding of drought. Right now in Brazil, as uh, Sandra can probably attest to, because she's Brazilian, they have two understandings of drought, long-term drought or short-term drought. And that's not necessarily based on any solid evidence. I mean, they do their best to try to, to, try to do it objectively, but the drought monitor map and the process for producing it involves a lot of indicators that are agreed upon that are more objective, and then the plans themselves link actions to and trigger are triggered by uh, by the map categories so you're in level one drought level two drought it triggers various policy actions that were pre-negotiated with the community beforehand so we're doing this in several cities in the northeast we're doing this in uh, local communities of a, a rain-fed agricultural community and then also at a whole river basin level and the idea is that we don't know we don't pretend to know the exact right level to do this at, the exact right scale, but we're demonstrating it, showing proof of concept, if you will, so that the communities and the state officials can then, when they figure out where it's best for them to do it, they can have examples to build from, and they can scale it up. So now I'm gonna totally shift gears and talk for the last two minutes about this idea of climate and disaster risk screening. So the other, another effort I'm involved with is to essentially screen all World Bank operations from July 2014 onward, which is 200, 300, 400 plus projects for climate and disaster risk. And I should mention this is the most vulnerable countries. These are called the IDA countries. And this is to meet a commitment that the World Bank made to its donors, essentially, those that are giving the billions of dollars to the World Bank to actually do development work. Three commitments on climate change to, skip, to screen at the high level country documents, uh, project level to, to screen all operations, literally every single operation that is happening in a, the most vulnerable, or excuse me, the poorest countries are being screened for climate disaster risks. So what we did to help to meet this obligation that we set upon ourselves, I guess, but it, what, we're, what we did was we're creating and about to launch a climate risk screening tool. Um, and what it does is a high level screening, it's not an adaptation tool. It doesn't actually suggest adaptation options. But I think of it more as a socialization tool because there are so many people within my institution that don't understand climate risks. They, they understand very well the vulnerability and these inequality issues. And that actually bring, that is actually brought into this process of screening risk. But they don't necessarily understand the climate hazards. They get intimidated by climate models. So we've tried to make that easier through this tool and it will be available to the public in, uh, in early 2015. But it's available right now internally to help, them, help us meet this obligation of screening for risks. This is a quick snapshot of what it looks like. Now it probably will change a little bit. Um, but it is linked to something you can access now. And if you don't know it already, the World Bank has, I think, a really nice repository of information on climate change uh, called the Climate Change Knowledge Portal. And this portal brings together the best of the best climate information. It's being populated right now. They are five climate models. It has vulnerability assessments, adaptation profiles, risk profiles. And again, it's not perfect, but we found, especially in a validating meeting yesterday, that a lot of the development agencies 
are turning to this as a, as a resource, but the, the screening tool itself is actually linked directly to it in a seamless way so that, uh, so that the, the team leaders within the, the World Bank that are doing the projects that have, to act, that have to screen them can actually get easy access to climate information that is relatively, I say relatively, easy to interpret because when you're dealing with scenarios, it's not ever really simple to interpret, but we try to make it easier for them. So the last slide is just to show um, recognition to the many colleagues that are helping to co-lead various elements of this program. Thank you very much. Oops, I'm electric. Um, okay, finally we have uh, uh, Petra, she's going to uh, have a five minute <laughs> you know, participation and then we will have uh, time for questions. Thank you. I'll make that very brief. Uh, just bear with us for maybe four more minutes here. We do want to have some questions. I don't want to say that all maps are bad. I'm a geographer. I love maps. I just want to say be careful what you put into them and make sure they get interpreted the way you wish they will. I don't do any vulnerability mapping myself. My focus has been to work with people we are usually categorizing as vulnerable and see if we as researchers can enhance adaptive capacities. And I want to show you just a couple of slides from a project we had funded by the NSF on adaptive capacities or more particularly on anticipatory capacity. How can we work with vulnerable populations to enhance their abilities to prepare for possible disasters rather than getting harmed by them uh, when an event occurs? And this is a complicated graphic. That's our conceptual framework. What I really want you to understand is at the center is this anticipatory capacity. And we think we can work towards it by looking at what people know, their memory, notes of reflection, and iterative learning and re-performance by going through a variety of learning activities with vulnerable populations in rural areas in Ghana and Tanzania. And it's their choice in the end if they want to adjust, if they can adjust, or if the answer is a more radical transformation. And these are some of my colleagues, climatologists, landscape ecologists, and the person who does adult education. So a premise here for anticipatory learning is that it really depends on learning from the past. What is it people know? What is it they have experienced? Monitoring the present and incorporating surprise into possible futures. And that allows us to think about how we can enhance and measure anticipatory capacity and how we can create tools for decision-making processes. We start by looking at drivers of change. What is it people have noticed? What has changed over the last 30 years? What is it going to change over the future? How can we monitor erosion that is happening now? How can we understand where people go and observe changes in their landscapes? How can we understand how people evaluate their own capacities to anticipate change? How do they understand issues of leadership in their community? How do they understand issues of accountability? And how does that allow them to think how the future could be in 25 years from now? So it's a very participatory approach because enhancing capacities cannot come from just distributing climate information. The core of our activity was participatory scenario building. So don't think about the IPCC scenarios. Think about how we can possibly envision, pos how we can envision possible futures. We start with drivers of change. Uh, what has changed? What is likely to change? And we ask people to simply draw a storyline of how their community could look like in 25 years from now with all the possible challenges and opportunities we overlay those with the most sophisticated downscaled projections we have for the area, but not in this form, but in very simple drawings, in this case, on the ground, to see whether or not an awareness about um, increased temperature, more unpredictability with the onset of the rainy season, less rain days, but more intensity of rains, particularly in the month 7 July, impact their future scenarios. These scenarios, of course, are not driven by climate, but as we said earlier, and Heidi made that point again, by challenges that preoccupy people in their communities. And these are challenges for four Ghanaian communities, for four Tanzanian communities, 
And you can see climate change is not part of those. People are worried about poverty, hunger, erosion, deforestation, child um, uh, pregnancy. This is what the concerns look like. And what we do is we create the space for people to explore their possible futures within the constraints. The final scenarios that happen to be on large drawings create wonderful storylines that lend themselves to be acted out. So one additional learning loop here is to create space for participatory scenario where people say, well, if the reality really comes true, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for men, for women? Where are the trade-offs? Where are the opportunities for us? And where are the constraints? And where is it we need help? What we saw is that most of the Ghanaian communities are very positive. They saw a lot of positive um, elements in their future scenarios, lots of hope. Whereas in the Tanzanian communities, most of the scenario elements were negative. People are very afraid, very pessimistic about the hope. And so understanding fears and opportunities and hope within these contexts is important. And I want to leave you with a quote here because I think it shows that we as researchers can also do incredibly important work that is of use to communities, one of our major collaborators. Participatory program with big universities. I didn't believe in it. We at APDO, the Afram Plains Development Organization in Ghana, said we could do it with them, <coughs> the researchers. You, Penn State, called it research, but not normal research tools you proposed, tools that were more engaging to communities. It doesn't look academic. Processes were more engaging to learning, anticipating, planning, not only for the formally educated. Surprising to me that academics can also change. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much to all panelists. I think it was a great session. So. Uh, okay, so now we have, uh, we have some time for questions, so um, uh, if uh, anybody wants to start, uh, or otherwise I can start with a question and let you think a little bit about it. One thing that I want to warn everybody is that one of our panelists, Nathan, he has to leave at four. Uh, so if we happen to have a very interesting discussion and we're going to have more questions, then Nathan, you're free to go. <laughs> but uh, if, if we wrap it up in 15 minutes, then... Uh, you know, so we have 15 minutes so to have Nathan in the panel and, uh, and answer some questions. So, uh, anybody right now? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start. So I, I the question that I have actually it was similar to what Ben had this morning for the other panel, and I was thinking about uncertainties and definitely the theme and the topics that you're uh, you know dealing with. Uh, maybe thinking about uncertainty is just something that is not necessarily straightforward, and that shows a little bit to what Petra was telling me before, how complex, how difficult it is to really understand what is vulnerability uh, and how to, to you know, as, as a grad student, how you, how you approach that as a, as a scientific, you know, enterprise. And I think in each of your research topics or, or your, the things that you're working with, you deal with that complexity and you see how this is evolving or how it's changing. So my question to you is, is, is how you see this you know, how do you see, see this in the, in the future? You know, what, is, what are the uncertainties? What are the things that we need to be thinking of and, uh, and, and in which way we can sort of learn from, from mistakes or things that we've done before? I know it's very broad, but maybe that's a good way just to sort of start the conversation. So, anybody? I can kick it off very quickly. I think all of us have a tendency to look for safety and security and certainty it's just that the real world doesn't work that way. And I think in our collaborations with community members on the ground, we say our rule number one is to embrace uncertainty. Let's embrace the facts we don't know and cannot know yet um, to move towards the creation of futures that are viable and beneficial to us despite the uncertainties we have today whether they relate to climate or economic conditions or health or conflict. And let's work with the elements we do know and can control and let's feel more comfortable with embracing uncertainty as something that needs to guide our decision-making processes both today and in the future. So 
I think we shouldn't shy away from uncertainties, mm -hmm. but I think where we can have more clarity, what I referred to earlier in vulnerability studies and mapping and indices, of course we should strive for it because I think there's lots of improvement from the science perspective, but we should not wish for pure certainty. We will never have it. I think that um, in addition to what Petra just said, that there is a, there's a lot that can be done to look at the adaptive capacity and, and thinking about being able to have the space to manage those risks that are unknown, you know, the uncertainties. So there are, I, th I, I turn back to the example that I was saying on the drought preparedness program, and, and, and the whole idea there was that Brazil is facing persistent drought in the Northeast, and we, there's a lot of infrastructure projects that have happened in the past um, to control cert uncertainty, and it's helped to buffer. There's social safety net programs like Bolsa Familia and Bolsa Estiaging that have helped to not create an unimaginable crisis in this, in this current drought and force migrations, et cetera. But there, you know, what happens if one more year of drought happens in 2014? It's going to be a crisis, and you know, how do we deal with that? We think about ways that we can anticipate the risk. It's anticipatory uh, planning and anticipatory adaptation, and being able to manage the, that space of uncertainty, I think, is, is, is doing more proactive planning. Uh, then I also just want to mention really briefly that there's a, there's a whole unit within my team that is doing, not my team, but the team I'm on that's doing uh, decision making under uncertainty methods. Uh, I think Petra is well aware of it, and I, th I think that's really fascinating work. It never, it's not claiming to be able to predict the future, but trying to be robust to alternative mm -hmm. plausible futures. I think there's a very interesting uh, developing conversation there. Okay, so you have a question, you can come to the microphone. Yeah. And again, if, if students are Students have priority, <laughs> but. Hi, my name is Mike McCabe. Oh, McCabe. hi, did you want to say something? No, oh. no, no please. No, no, yeah. please. Oh, he was just going to say one thing about um, future directions. And one thing we were talking about it, I was talking with Nate earlier about it. One thing that I feel very passionately about is, um, is sort of teaching the complexities of these issues to undergraduates and um, in the classroom. And really, you know, we sort of live in this neoliberal world where it's the re individual's responsibility to, you know, make good economic choices and be resilient. But I think as we've all shown today that that's, that's not possible for everyone, nor is it desired by everyone. And so I see that as um, not only a researcher, but an educator to really uh, highlight those issues in, in the classroom and uh, hope that my students become more empathetic through that process. Hi, um, I'm Mike McCabe. I'm a student at Blaustein um, studying urban and regional planning. And I have a question for the gentleman from the World Bank. And I, I want to preface this with I don't want to put this all on you uh, because there's a lot of great representatives from the World Bank. but. When you talk about things like adaptation and vulnerability and adaptive capacity, there's a real disconnect between all of the other policies of the World Bank and the need to foster adaptation, right? And so I want to see, or I want to ask you how you reconcile that contradiction because I mean, I'm very familiar with the politics of Brazil and there's a history of structural adjustment. There's also a history of privatization, um, not so much of water, but a lot of other infrastructure but then there's an issue of drought. And it's clearly disproportionately affecting the poor. And you know, I've been to a lot of events like this where representatives from the World Bank or the IMF are really great people. Um, but there's always this response that comes, well, we're working on it. Um, you know, but it's been several decades and people keep dying as a result of your policies. Well, that's a light one to end on. Um, well, all I have to say is this, is I can't pretend to represent the institution history. So what I do know is that we have a president right now, Jim Kim, who is incredibly committed to this. He's made some very difficult decisions from a, um, from a high level perspective on doing things because, not doing things because of climate change. So I think that we're talking about 
an institution that is as large as the one that I work in. The change that you might want to see doesn't happen as rapidly as you'd like to see, as many of us would like to see. Um, but in the several years that I've been there, I do see some, some, some changes. And again, just to, to reiterate that I, I'm in no way taking responsibility for something that I was not involved with. And I don't think that, I don't, specifically on the issue of Brazil, uh, I'm not sure exactly to the structural and privatization policies you're referring to, but I know that there is a, the World Bank's work, at least in the people that I come in, in contact with, is very well received. Granted, there are various different communities there. So, um, so overall, I'd say, um, yeah, I think I'd end it at that. Okay, anybody? Yes? Hi, um, my name is Il Yun Ko from Columbia Season. Um, thank you for sharing your talk, and you have shared a lot of various aspects of vulnerability, and you provided some solutions for climate change adaptation. And my question is, like, moving on to the next step, um, what do you think will be the expected challenges that might occur in applying these adaptation strategies and challenge and policies into practice? That's an easy question with an easy answer. The challenge is that there is not enough money on the table for adaptation. The Green Climate Fund, which was agreed to in Copenhagen in 2009 and officially instituted in 2010 in Cancun, has generated so far $9.8 billion, which is a couple of billion short of the goal that was set before Lima. Lima will start the Conference of the Parties, number 20 in Lima in 10 days. Um, the goal is to have 100 billion by 2020 every year until 2050. So the major challenge is that the North, the large emitters are not willing to put the money on the table that is needed for adaptation. So just quickly, so um, specific to the prepared program that I described, uh, a major challenge um, is the availability of data that we can use to construct these indices. Um, that's a, a major difficulty right now. I mean, there's so many uh, gaps um, in so many ways, but, um, but the, the work is starting and, um, and hopefully it'll, it'll evolve quickly. Hi, um, I'm Asher, I'm a grad student here. Um, this can be really to anyone. Um, unfortunately, there's still too much controversy about whether climate change is even happening, and that tends to be represented in terms of discussions about emissions policies, but um, I, I was just wondering to what degree in your practice of adaptation work and in your sort of academic discourse, do you feel that that political affiliation, how, to what degree does that shape perceptions of vulnerability and adaptive capacity? And that's uh, to anyone. No, the perceptions. people's perceptions that you work with and you know, in the projects that you've been engaged with. Well, <laughs> I know I'll that's a very broad that, question. I'll say that um, a, lot of, a lot of people think that the U.S. is unique in, in, in being resistant to the, the concept, and I won't name countries that it's a difficult conversation to have that in, but what I will say is that one avenue that I personally have found it easier to have this conversation when it's difficult is to talk again about, particularly when you're dealing with droughts, about the issue of building drought preparedness, because I think that the mechanisms and the institutions that you need in place, those, pa those well-worn pathways between institutions and strengthening those co the, con the connections between them, that that is indicative in itself of 
what we need for broader climate change. You know, having the HydroMet services, sharing data, having it interoperable, that's, that's going to be helpful no matter what. So I think you can, you know, I, I'm not recommending that you bypass the conversation, but if you, you know, you're not able to have that conversation, there are other ways to do it. You know, that's an interesting question because what I see happening in the field, and again, my work is primarily with rural communities, NGOs in Africa, but I also work in India and in Nepal, is that even people in the communities know really well that there's a vulnerability discourse. They know the language, right? And not only NGO folks who do vulnerability assessments or adaptation assessments, people in the communities know the discourse. And they will tell you even before you ask, saying, we are the most vulnerable. And this has triggered a perverse race to the bottom, right? Every community, every country wants to be the most vulnerable because people understand that being vulnerable opens venues to getting adaptation money. What it completely obscures is capacities people have, capacities that can be fostered, it also obscures limits to adaptation. So the discourse we have created has become its own beast. And I think it's our job to look for more productive ways to get onto a trajectory that is more ethical. Thank you. I, I think you also were lining up for a question. Hi, so I'm Rahul, uh, undergraduate studying environmental science here at Rutgers. Uh, first, I want to thank you for coming and speaking here today. Uh, my question is, so to build proper adaptation, it seems like we need to first address um, vulnerability. And what seems to be at the core of differential contextual vulner uh, vulnerability is this idea of addressing first um, socioeconomic inequity. Um, so my question is then, how do we address the socioeconomic inequity in order to adapt to climate change? Thank you. You got it. <laughs> that is the key question, right? And I think just the way you have framed it, it makes it very clear that we cannot address climate change without addressing development and equitable and fair development. And, you know, many countries jump onto the climate change bandwagon because it externalizes the failure, their failure in investing in equitable development so we can claim it on a climate hazard. But it's really coming back to the principles of what does it mean to provide a safe living condition to every single citizen. So you're absolutely right. So that's where we have to go. Yeah. Um, I think that places that are urbanizing rapidly, there's a real opportunity to try to not make the same mistakes that have been made in other places in terms of providing uh, sanitation infrastructure, water supply infrastructure. I mean, they're, they're the housing, so that the housing quality isn't so unequal, you know, so maybe that's one area where there's some opportunity. I think that, um, sorry, did you no, go So I think this also gets back to the, the other gentleman who had asked the very critical question of me, um, that, the institution as a whole, the World Bank, obviously has that as their mission. Our mission is to end poverty and, and, redu and, produ and build shared prosperity. Now, what that meant to the institution, the people that worked there before me, I don't know. But what I do know now is that that actually has been internalized into every single project. And it wasn't necessarily done so in the past. So you are strongly encouraged when you're developing a project with your counterparts to figure out how that project, in order to get funded and actually implemented and approved, contributes to those goals. And they're very tangible goals. It's, you know, redu ending poverty or reducing poverty and, sh and building shared prosperity, which is the inequality issue. If you cannot link your program to that, then there's a high likelihood that it will not be passed. Now. I think that's where it starts, and I think that's, again, where I see the institution going. And internalizing it in that way is, is one start, and I hope that other institutions are doing that. 
My short answer to that would be to get rid of capitalism. <laughs> but um, in the meantime, uh, I, yeah, I agree with Petra that I think develop need, development needs to be much more uh, horizontal and bottom up. Um, and I worked with one municipio in uh, what's the, uh, so like a county uh, mm -hmm. um, in in um, Mexico that was doing a really really good job of this, and they were. Um, they were getting funds from the government and going to the communities in that county and saying, um, you know, what's, we've got this much money this year, what's working for you, what do you need support with, um, let's learn about what you're doing right and share it with uh, other communities. And it was very much based on transparency and dialogue and knowledge sharing, um, and it was working really well. I think I'm told that you have to leave, Nathan. <laughs> if you want to make your train, but I think we have more, one more question to the panel, so maybe we can have this. Hi, uh, my Hi. name. <laughs> my name's Klaus Rittenbach. And uh, I was really struck, um, Heidi, by your, your slides of, of Ghana, where, where these foreign countries come in and basically rape and pillage the environment to extract the gold. And so to me, that, that's like emblematic of what's happening over various places throughout the world. So how do you deal with that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what's happening, um, None of this happens in a vacuum. So I think that one thing that research can do is it can really like unpack the social relationships and practices that are allowing these things to happen. Um, and so in my own work, I do a lot of state ethnography. Um, and I really look at the political relationships that allow, um, th that allow sort of these illegal land grabs to, to occur. Um, and I don't know, you know, I hope that through that there's some sort of like, there's a process of transparency that happens. Um, I don't know, I don't, have, I don't have a great answer for that. Um, yeah. Let me just add on to that because it relates to the question of structural adjustment programs. So what you've seen in the slides is primarily local people devastating their lands. And the reason they're doing that is because they have been displaced from their livelihood. They used to be small-scale miners, and small-scale mining was a really viable livelihood. Ghana was known as the Gold Coast. Um, what happened during the 70s and 80s when structural adjustment programs kicked in, not just in Brazil, but also in West Africa and Ghana, was the state needed desperately to attract foreign investors to come and so there are 35 foreign, multinational, large-scale gold mining companies in Ghana that you didn't see, but because most of the land is leased out to these multinational corporations, typically for 99 years, to get royalties that were imposed through structural adjustment programs, the small-scale miners have nowhere else to go other than to encroach on concession land, which makes them illegal. And some of it is then, of course, amplified through the mushrooming of small-scale mining sites, through bribery, and so on. Some of these mines that you saw have to do with Chinese miners who have come in over the last 10 years, five years, primarily, there are 50,000 of them, largely illegal. Why? Because they find a loophole in the absence of a state taking care of small-scale miners as a poverty reduction strategy. Okay, so um, uh, I would like to uh, thank the panel uh, and please join me in thanking them. Uh, I, thanks to everybody for staying until now. I think it's been a really exciting day and exciting symposium. I want, we need to thank uh, Jim for being our MC today, it was great. And I think Marjorie is not here, but this is the person that we need to clap and stand up. There she is. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks again.